Okay, good evening. We'll give you a five minutes. Uh, the restrooms are back here just for ourselves to get ready to begin our first presentation. So it's good to see you all here.
Good evening, everyone, both uh, present in person and also via our live stream. And welcome to the first installment of our year-long Eucharist lecture series hosted by Notre Dame Seminary. My name is Jordan Haddad, and I am the director of lay ministry programs and lay formation here at the seminary. Although we just uh, were blessed to have uh, benediction, please join me in a short prayer to start this evening. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord Jesus Christ, we profess with the certainty of faith that you are present to us in the most holy Eucharist to strengthen us throughout our earthly pilgrimage. Draw us more deeply to yourself, to your Eucharistic heart, that we might know, love, and serve you all the days of our life. Receive us, Lord, as we receive you, and by this divine union, remake us into your image and likeness, lighting within us the flame of love to draw others to your Eucharistic presence. Amen. As I'm sure you are all well aware, Archbishop Amen recently announced that we as an archdiocese will be celebrating a year of the Eucharist and St. Joseph for 2021. This is a timely decision since even before the COVID pandemic, if you can remember such a time, we as a Catholic Church in America have struggled to fully understand and embrace our Eucharistic faith. A recent Pew Research Center survey found that only 30% of Catholics in America and about 70% of Catholics who attend Mass weekly believe that Jesus Christ is truly present in the Eucharist, body, blood, soul, and divinity. With the COVID pandemic, many have not had access to the Eucharist for a variety of different reasons, which only exacerbates this issue and has caused great sadness and distress among so many. And so Father Jim Weiner, our rector president, upon hearing of Archbishop's uh, decision to make this a year devoted to the Eucharist, decided that the seminary would participate in the celebration by hosting a year-long lecture series on the Eucharist. Along with our presentation tonight, we will have different Notre Dame Seminary professors offer presentations on the Eucharist each month for the remainder of the year every third Wednesday of the month at 6 p.m. in Schulte Auditorium. These events will touch upon the Eucharist and other related topics such as the, the scriptures, human suffering, the moral life, poetry, art, family, miracles, and devotions. No presentation will be the same, but all will revolve around our Catholic faith in the real presence of the Eucharist and his deep love for us therein. Furthermore, each presentation will be preceded by a holy half hour, 30 minutes of Eucharistic adoration. For what better way is there to know and love our Lord than to sit at his feet and to adore him? We are very fortunate to have Father Jim Weiner, our rector president, as our speaker tonight. Father Jim was ordained a priest for the Diocese of Pittsburgh in 1995 after completing doctoral studies at the Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome, he served as the rector of St. Paul's Seminary in Pittsburgh for six years. He also previously served as the diocesan director for evangelization, permanent diaconate, vocations, and clergy and ministerial formation. He is the author of The Evangelization Equation, The Who, What, and How. He was appointed rector president of Notre Dame Seminary by Archbishop Amen on July 1, 2012 and has faithfully served the seminary community ever since. As my boss, I could keep going on singing his praises until all of your ears fall off, but I will save that for another day. His presentation tonight, which is our inaugural lecture for this series, is entitled The Eucharist and the Life of the Church. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Father Jim to the podium. Thank you, Dr. Jordan. Those always sound like an obituary, so uh, thank you, Jordan. Now, every presentation I give, I first of all, I want to welcome to those joining us by live streaming. I'm told there's 130 people joining us this way. There's about 60 of you here present, so thanks for 
making time this evening, and as Dr. Jordan said, no presentation will be the same for the rest of the year. So we're going to start with a very low threshold, and these talks will only get better as we go through the year here. Now, every presentation, I start off with this story from the philosopher Kierkegaard about why people have a difficulty understanding truth. Pope Benedict XVI has used the same story when we talk about faith. And as Dr. Jordan just gave us that statistic, it's amazing that only 30% of practicing Catholics believe in the true nature, the true presence of the Eucharist. So something has gone wrong uh, of how Catholics, at the very core of who we are as a people, that that teaching has slipped by. Without the Eucharist, there is no church. And we've seen in 2,000 years an attempt to be church without Eucharist. So why is this such a difficulty? So here's the story, very simple. Uh, you've heard me tell it before for those of you who've heard presentations. The circus. So the circus is coming into the village. And the whole village is excited that the circus is coming into town. So as the circus is preparing for the evening performance, located on the outskirts of the village in an open field, they're putting up the tents, everybody's getting into their costumes, the whole town is excited, then a fire breaks out. And the fire is working its way towards the village. The manager of the circus dispatches the two fastest people that can get into the village to get everyone prepared to stop the fire from coming. The two fastest people were already dressed for the evening performance as clowns. So these two clowns come running into the village square and everybody comes out, they're very animated, and said, look, there's a fire coming in from the circus. If we work together, we can stop this fire from coming. And everyone just stood there. And at some point, the people started applauding they're thinking this is a commercial for the evening performance. Well, the fire came and burned down the whole village. Why couldn't the villagers see right in front of them and hear right in front of them a truth that was being spoken? Well, because it was coming off of the lips of two clowns. The credibility of that statement of that announcement was questioned because it was coming off of the lips of two clowns. When the Catholic Church proposes the gospel in its entirety, is it sometimes coming from priests who have abused children and therefore the teaching is invalidated? Is it coming from a church where its teachings of the 21st century seem archaic that those teachings have expired. So if the Catholic Church's moral authority and its teaching authority is falling on deaf ears, is it hard for Catholics to even believe in the centrality of who we are as Catholics? Maybe the whole thing's made up. Superstition. Did the Catholic Church make up the Eucharist? That's what people are struggling with. Really, to take bread and wine and this is now going to be consecrated literally into the body and blood of Jesus, or for heaven's sake. We're educated people, people might say. The people that believe in that are uneducated, pietistic, or superstitious. And that type of pessimism and negativity and cynicism can be easily bought into. That's why before he died, the very last encyclical that St. John Paul II wrote to us was on the Eucharist. The Latin title is Ecclesia de Eucharistia, and I'm not going to use this document and walk through it and dissect it with you. Uh, the title is just simply called On the Eucharist. Uh, I would encourage you to access it through the internet uh, and to be able to read it. It's not a difficult read, but it's very much on the framework of the statement that I made. We have no church without the Eucharist. Without the priesthood, there's no Eucharist. 
Now, obviously, the mission here at Notre Dame Seminary is to form competent, happy, healthy, holy priests. Just as a footnote to that, this year we began in August with the largest enrollment ever in the history of Notre Dame Seminary, ever. And then a COVID broke out. So, Let me read to you the words of institution from 2,000 years ago. This is taken from the Gospel of Matthew. During the mail, Jesus took bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to his disciples. Take this and eat it. This is my body. Then he took a cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them. All of you must drink from this, for this is my blood, the blood of the covenant, to be poured out on behalf of many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink this fruit of the vine from now until the day when I drink it anew with you in the Father's kingdom. Then after singing songs of praise, they went to the Mount of Olives. Now just give me a moment here to contextualize just a little bit of theology, which I know you're very familiar with. So the Lord says, take this, eat and drink, and do this in memory of me. With those words, the institution of the Eucharist takes place as well as the priesthood. From the upper room then springs forth the church. The church did not create the Eucharist. It's the other way around, and that's basically the title of this document. The Eucharist is the foundation of the church. With those words, do this in memory of me. Take, eat, and drink. Springing from those words in that upper room is the beginnings of the church. Let me take a step back. We call this the Paschal Mystery. In the middle of this Paschal Mystery is this institution of the Eucharist and the priesthood. But the Paschal Mystery is Christ himself who's being sacrificed to save the whole world. The beginning of this Paschal Mystery begins with his own suffering, then his death, then his resurrection, then the outpouring of the Spirit, Pentecost, and then the ascension. Those are the five moments of this Paschal mystery. In the midst of all of this, what we would celebrate, Holy Thursday, is the institution of the Eucharist within this Paschal mystery. Why does Jesus wait till the end of his ministry? He has now gathered a people, disciples, and in that upper room with the apostles, then with this community being formed, now begins the beginnings of the church, of which she will be born on Pentecost Sunday. But through this whole Paschal mystery, the church is being birthed, then only born on Pentecost. So I want to make that statement, if you clarify, that sometimes people think, you'll hear this, that the church created the Eucharist, that we made this up. It's the other way around. It's from the Eucharist that the church is springing forth. So thanks for giving that just that little bit of a, a theological clarification. Now, in the midst of this paschal sacrifice, just that word sacrifice, something terrible, something dark is happening within this whole paschal mystery. And I want to take a step back to the mystery of evil. In Latin, this is called the mysterium iniquitatis, the mystery of evil. It's in the context of scandal, desecration, that we're finding the light of Christ breaking forth. But let's go all the way back to the beginning. The Garden of Eden, there is a desecration that occurs. So from the very first moment, man desecrates the Garden of Eden. It's somehow permitted in God's divine providence that this falling to Lucifer, falling to evil, pride is the original sin. Man prefers himself over to God's design. And this is permitted. But we know that God's not going to leave them there. 
So already with a desecration and an evil, we're seeing God's design breaking forth. The first murder, Cain murders Abel. The family is desecrated. We find the world with the flood and Noah's faith to navigate us through this destruction. We have Moses leading the people from slavery into something that's new. We move to the Last Supper, the most essential element of our faith. And what's happening during that Last Supper? A desecration. Evil is in that upper room, and Judas Iscariot falls to it. The first mass, there's desecration. Think of that. The betrayal of Judas. The very first mass, there is a desecration. Shortly thereafter, Peter's abandonment and denial of Jesus. A relationship of scandal and even a form of desecration. And of course, we come to the scandal of Good Friday. We tried to kill God. The desecration that occurs at Golgotha. And yet, in the midst of all of this mysterium iniquitatis, this mystery of evil, is the mystery of holiness, pietatis. The mystery of God's power not leaving us broken, destroyed, sinful, and falling to the enemy. In the midst of this desecration is the beginnings of the Eucharist in the church. On Good Friday, Our Lady is at the foot of the cross with John, and she is gifted to us while he's dying. See, this is the power of God's providence. So what does this all mean for all of us as we participate in a new creation that what was broken in the Garden of Eden is now being repaired, resurrected, and redeemed? The Lord has instituted the Eucharist, of which now we can refer to the liturgy and the Mass, as our participation in the beginnings of something new that God always wanted for us. Matter of fact, John Paul even says in the encyclical here, we don't have to wait till we're dead to start experiencing the kingdom of God. That's the central message of Jesus' preaching. The kingdom of God is here in me. I am the way, I am truth, and I am life. So the Eucharist is instituted as a gateway for us to already begin being fed. Jesus tells us that man cannot live by bread alone. So on the day of our baptism, when we were baptized into this new creation, the spiritual life, our Lord is with us, and that spiritual life needs to be fed. Again, the gift of the Holy Eucharist. You know, we refer to the sacrifice of the Mass, because it truly is a sacrifice. I mentioned the word, the Paschal mystery. The word Paschal, you could hear uh, the translation of the word lamb in there. Remember the Old Testament event where Moses is now going to lead the people from slavery in Egypt to this promised land, but the sign of faith would be to slaughter the lamb, to put its blood on the doorpost, while the angel of death passed over, the passing over. This then begins a foretaste of our desire for heaven. God has created every one of us to reach out to the heavens. We want to taste it. We want to see it. We want to hear it. And we've been created with that type of anthropology. As a matter of fact, There's no such thing as an atheist. Everyone desires truth. It's who we are as a people. So the sacrifice of the Mass, as this Passover has occurred, what do the people of God, the Hebrew people, begin as we see in their long journey towards the Promised Land? A celebration of that event in which the lamb now is being sacrificed, its skin is being eaten, The blood of the lambs being sprinkled. This is a sign of the people who want to be sprinkled by the divine power of God 
and we even want to eat it, eating the flesh, the burnt flesh of the lamb. Now, can you imagine when John the Baptist introduces Jesus to, to John's disciples? Look, behold, there's the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Now, for the average Jewish person, that might sound blasphemous. Hold it. You just took one of our most sacred events and you, you're personifying this in him, that guy over there. Behold, there's the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Because in fact, what's being prefigured in that preaching is there is going to be a slaughter. There's going to be a sprinkling of God upon us, of a grace. And that which we can start consuming, literally, spiritually. So that's the beginning of Jesus' ministry with John making that announcement. We today call this type of theology the priesthood of Jesus. That word of God in the Old Testament, that word of God that was on the lips of the prophets, preparing the people for the promised land and eventually for the Messiah and Emmanuel, that word is now Christ himself. The word has become flesh and dwells among us. The word by which the priests were offering sacrifices that sacrifice now is Christ. And the kings, the word by which they would lead their people to protect them, that word has now become flesh. So Jesus, his priesthood, he literally now is the priest, the prophet, and the king of the Old Testament, all in him. And my dear friends, we're baptized into this priesthood of Jesus, which means we are priests, prophets, and kings. The Eucharist is something now, a gift given to us, which is going to feed our vocations as Christians to be priest, prophet, and king. Now, what I would like to do uh, is go back to the words of institution, as well as a moment in the liturgy at Mass to bring together this idea of sacrifice. Because we're not spectators to Jesus' sacrifice. There's our sacrifice as Christians, right? Pick up the cross and follow me. The Lord doesn't want suffering for us. But we now know that the gateway to heaven is through the cross. To take the greatest weapon of the devil. What's the greatest weapon of the devil? Death. To take the greatest weapon of the devil to turn this around and now make it the gateway to heaven. Did Jesus Christ come back from the dead? He did not. He rose from the dead. And thankfully, we've got many medical professionals that can sometimes bring people back from, uh, from the dead, in a sense. No, Christ rose from the dead. He resurrected. Touch me. I'm not a ghost. Feel me. See me. Hear me. See, we're baptized into this resurrection. You, too, will rise with me. That's the good news. You too will rise with me. So let's go back to the Mass for a moment. And I want to spend a little time reflecting on this. Usually after the homily, the profession of faith, there's the collection. Okay, but there's something else going on besides the collection. Sometimes there's two collections. It's not half time. So sometimes... I know during COVID, we, we've, I think most churches have stopped this. The gifts are being brought down the aisle right through, right through the congregation. Bread and wine's being brought down. Uh, the priest is saying particular prayers, preparing for this bread and wine to be consecrated. Sometimes we'll even incense it, walk around the altar and incense. The priest is washing his hands to get ready for this. And then what does he say? Now let us pray that my sacrifice and yours be acceptable to God, the Father, the Almighty. I want to reflect on that for a moment. Let us now pray that my sacrifice and yours be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. You know, there are three sacrifices that occur at every Mass. Yours, mine, and Jesus's. And they are all lifted up together through him, with him, and in him is your sacrifice and my sacrifice. 
of which you're literally going to eat a little bit later in that Mass. So when people say, Mass is boring, I get bored. I don't understand what's going on. One of the most active moments of the liturgy is that moment when that bread and wine is working its way to the altar. What you're doing in the congregation, you're seeing that bread and wine, and you are spiritually placing on the altar your sacrifice. Is it a sacrifice of pain, health, there's something terrible going on in your family, marriage, confusion, is it something more of a spiritual suffering? Lord, I, I'm here, <laughs> but boy, I'm, I'm really struggling. Lord, I'm, I'm staying chaste. It's been a good week, no porn, drink. I'm really trying to be chaste, and it's hard. My, my marriage and family, it's taken everything for us to stay faithful. See, you prepared for Mass, every Mass, Sunday, weekday Mass, and you're bringing that with you. It might be a sacrifice of thanksgiving. Lord, you blessed me this past week. See, I did my best to stay faithful, and my goodness, the blessings at, at work, at home, at school. And you bring that sacrifice of thanksgiving, and you're placing it so that when the celebrant says, let us now pray that my sacrifice, which you don't know what it is, you know publicly, it's celibacy, it's obedience, it's my assignment, it's being a teacher of the faith, trying to grapple through the things that you're grappling with, and then my own personal sacrifice of that day, that week. You don't know what it is. I'm not going to put it in the bulletin or read it to you, but I'm bringing it, every priest is, and you're bringing yours. I would love, it would never happen. <laughs> At that moment, or the priest runs down, let us now pray that my sacrifice and yours, and he comes running off the altar and puts a microphone in his face. What is that? Do you actually know what your sacrifice is? Now, here's the part two to that that it may be acceptable. Lord, this is all I got. I was rushing around, get the kids ready for mass, and I whoosh, breezing into the church. <sighs> I don't know how much preparation I really did here. So the priest is going to say that on your behalf and the priest's own behalf. Let us now pray that my sacrifice and yours be acceptable. Because this is all I got this week, Lord. That's a powerful moment. And we're going to conjoin it to Jesus' sacrifice. Because as, as you heard, let me just read this again, the institution narrative from Matthew. I tell you, I will not drink this fruit of the vine from now until the day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's reign. What does that mean? The Last Supper never ended. This heavenly liturgy has been inaugurated, and our, the Masses that we're celebrating we're entering into this heavenly liturgy. Matter of fact, the one Eucharistic prayer, we even say, Lord, we pray that your angel may take this sacrifice to your altar in heaven, that altar in heaven, that heavenly liturgy, which is outside of time. So, you know, in the Apostles' Creed, what do we say? He suffered, died, and was buried, and, the Apostles' Creed, and he descended into hell. It's not Atlanta or Cleveland. <laughs> he left time sanctifies it, and is now re-entering back into time. So the heavenly liturgy is now inaugurated, and I will not drink this again until I'm with you at the heavenly table. It's still, this liturgy is underway. There's no such thing as a private mass. Every mass that's celebrated is the universal prayer of Jesus. It might just be the priest. And you mysteriously, mystically are still a part of what's happening in that liturgy, because the priest is drawing you into that. It's, it's all a part of the prayers. So in that moment again, let us now pray that my sacrifice and yours be acceptable to God the Almighty Father. My sacrifice, yours, and Jesus's.
and listen to the Eucharistic prayer as the consecration is occurring. Because then, through him, with him, and in him are all of our sacrifices. And then when you present yourself for Holy Communion, communion, we are in communion because, this blow your mind away, it does mine, all of our sacrifices, those physically present, those who could not be present legitimately, have all conjoined these sacrifices, which are now redeemed. Remember, death is now transformed into life. So your sacrifices are now turned into something that's life-giving and given right back. So just uh, you know, there's 200 people at Mass, and everyone intentionally put those sacrifices there, then to receive collectively into Jesus himself the one single sacrifice, which is Christ. So all three are now one single sacrifice of which now he wants us to feed off of, to be in communion with him and with each other. Wow. That's not boring. As I, the, the whole premise of our faith is there is no church. The mystical body of Christ, what makes it mystical and unified is the Eucharist. The body will die without it. And that's why we are so fervent. Not this is the altar is not a pharmacy. We recognize that personally we're being transformed into a new creation. As a community, as a church, the whole world is being recreated into God's original design. It's amazing. Now, part two to this. And this is, a, uh, this is not me, okay? This is a, a very common type of preaching on the Eucharist, which is more spiritual now, not so much theological. I would like you, when you're at Mass, to listen closely to the words of institution. Again, uh, I'm reading from the Gospel of Matthew. During the meal, Jesus took bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it. When we go to Mass, we're not spectators. It's not stadium seating. We're being drawn into the mystery, which means we, too, are being taken into the mystery of Jesus. We're being blessed from the moment of creation into baptism. We're being broken. There, there's no secret about that. The Lord said that. St. Paul, take off the old man, put on Christ. Take up the cross and follow me. To be a Christian means we're going to be broken, then given to the world. So I'd like you to maybe even do a little examination of conscience as I'm talking now and to pray about this because life is organic. So every Mass we go to, it's going to be a little bit different in terms of your participation and what you're bringing into this sacrifice of the Mass. So number one. Jesus took the bread. Well, what are you giving him? He's taking each one of us, the good, bad, and the ugly of who we are. We're sinners. What is it he's taking? Because he wants to take us to heaven. St. Paul writes this to Timothy. God's will is that everyone be saved and reach the full knowledge of truth. That's his universal salvific will. We say that in the creed, for us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. He wants to save us. He wants to take you. What does that feel like? Now, we could talk about vocation. Every Christian has a vocation. And it's, it's an unfolding vocation. I'm a priest. That's not past tense. It's a priesthood being lived now and into the future. But from your baptismal call, what is he taking from you that's good? What is he taking from you that's difficult? What is it that we're ashamed of? Because we would never want to desecrate the Last Supper, right? We don't want to desecrate the Garden of Eden. We don't want to desecrate Calvary. 
That's why intrinsic to this preparation is penance. Is he taking, when we're at Mass, again, we're all sinners. The seminarians know of my sins somewhat publicly. <laughs> we're all sinners. But when we're going to Mass and even presenting ourselves for the Eucharist, what's being taken in there? And our responsibility, as we're all called to be saints, is to be sure that we're giving God everything. And there's a certain confidence that the Christian has. You created me. You brought me into this existence. What do you want? I, I give you everything. And he wants everything. He wants us in heaven. So where are we at in life right now? What, what needs to be repaired, confessed, reconciled? How can you let God into your darkness? He wants to be there. He doesn't want you there. Matter of fact, there's an ancient Easter vigil homily. It's in the catechism where the homilist imagines that as Jesus, as he descends into hell in that moment of death, that the ancient homilist envisions Jesus saying, you, this is one last time, come with me. I'm the good shepherd. Can we be so blinded by our sins that we won't even recognize you know, there, there's a big theological, hell exists. Is there any, anyone in it? Different theologians will go back and forth with different arguments. But can one actually at that last moment have been so consumed by sin that we don't even recognize the voice anymore? The optimism is that the voice is heard. And one last time, come with me. So we can begin to work out this salvation now. And I know as Americans, one nation under God, we struggle with freedom. A freedom that sometimes, from the national creed, puts us in direct conflict with the gospel of Jesus Christ. The toleration of moral evil for individual rights. See, the Catholics, we say we're not better than anybody else, but we know the truth. We, we're trying to live it, but we know what it is. The Lord has given it to us. He took the bread. He's taking us. What are we giving to him? Is it the best that we can give to him? Secondly, he blessed it. Beginning with our baptism. He has blessed us with charisms and gifts. And not as an exercise of false humility, but can you name those? Thank the Lord for those. How has he blessed you as a Christian man, as a Christian woman, for those of you who are married, as a Christian family and a couple, for those of you who are divorced? How are you living out that suffering? My folks were divorced when I was in seventh grade. For those of you who are widowed, for those of you in high school, what does that blessing look like? Can we name it specifically? See, that story opened up with the circus. They, they, they couldn't hear the news. They were so blinded by the clowns and their preconceived notion. Can we be blinded by God's blessings to us? See, the Eucharist opens that all up. It, it feeds our spiritual life to help well up all of those blessings that can, again, make us into saints. What is your blessings? Can you, of the past, but even of the present, right now, God never stops blessing us. Thirdly, And he broke it. St. Augustine tells us this, that the vocation of every Christian is to be a martyr. Now, what does martyr mean? It, it's a legal term. Any lawyers here in the audience? <laughs> Martyrs, that's a legal term from the Greek, which means expert witnesses. You bring in the expert witness at the trial. That's a legal term. And that's carried over to... Who would die like this? Who, who are these Christians that are dying for this gospel? Well, the consistency, the joy, the singing of songs as they were being martyred, they were expert witnesses. They were martyrs. They were expert witnesses to this gospel. So martyrdom means, as I use St. Paul's words, we got to take off the old man. And sometimes it feels good. 
Well, I, I like this little bit of sin. It makes me feel a little good. Martyrdom means as expert witnesses, there's a, a moment of dying to self, dying to the old ways. And Christ is right there with us as we're being broken of that old way of thinking. So when the Eucharist is being celebrated, now the breaking is at the Lamb of God, when we're all singing the Lamb of God, the priest, if you watch what he's doing, he's ripping the host. And then we drop a piece of that into the chalice. He's being ripped in that liturgical moment. And it's going to feel that way if we let the Lord into our darkness to break out of the bonds of sin, the slavery of sin. And finally, then he gave it to his disciples. That's what the Lord wants to give to the world, you know, at the ascension. Now go, baptize all nations. Go, teach them, baptize all nations. That is the vocation of all of us, each in our own vineyards, each in our own corner of, of the pasture that the Lord has given to us. Go and tell the world the good news so that when Mass is ended, that's the charge. Not to run to Denny's for the breakfast special. <laughs> Maybe that's on the way. But how is the Christian who is on fire with the body and blood of Christ, which has just charged us with particular graces at that Mass, to go? To be a blessing to others? Maybe to be laughed at? It's all a part of the authentic Christian witness. But who can we learn this from in the a, in a, in a most perfect way? Mary, the first human tabernacle. In her pregnancy, and the early church fathers would refer to her as the new Eve, but sort of this first human tabernacle. She's pregnant. The body and blood of Christ is running through her and her through him. Pregnancy. And, and when the angel announces this to her and then announces what's happening to cousin Elizabeth, it's a Eucharistic grace that she went in haste. Didn't take an Uber, didn't stop off. She went in haste to this senior citizen couple who just found out that they're pregnant. That's the beginnings of well, how we're seeing Mary blessed. And she too is going to be uh, broken, as foretold by the prophetess and the prophet Simeon, that she is not going to be a spectator as well, that that Eucharistic experience is going to bring her to the cross. And there's going to be great sorrow only then, past that Easter, her now being the mother of the church, the queen of heaven. That's the gift he wants to give to each one of us. We can learn from her, stay close to her, as she is bringing us to him with her as mother. We don't have to do this alone. We're a pilgrim people on the move. So in conclusion, as John Paul II uh, in this encyclical on the Eucharist is simply reminding us, we cannot be church without the Eucharist. And so while this pandemic has separated so many, and necessarily, of course, from the Eucharist, this is an opportunity, as Archbishop Amen and Pope Francis is asking the whole world, for us to use the opportunity to rekindle that amazing Eucharistic faith. And that's got to begin with us. Is it possible for Catholics to still remain Catholic and have been adjusting to a new style of life that doesn't involve the Mass? That is a great pastoral concern. Are Catholics shaken by the scandals that we've seen? There was another one that just broke at 5 p.m. for this archdiocese. You'll see it on the news. So we're seeing both within the life of the church a faith that's shaken, a, a desecration of sorts, and we're seeing from outside of the church. This is the warfare that in God's mysterious design is permitted from the Garden of Eden with the desecration that occurred there, even at the first liturgy, the institution of the Eucharist, we have a desecration occurring. 
And from there, the church has always been under attack because Lucifer does not want us to be convinced of the truth. Rather, he wants us to see clowns, be paralyzed, to embrace mediocrity, and to do nothing. That's not what the, that's not what the church does. That's not who we are. We change the world. We evangelize culture. We don't force it. We propose it in a joyful, authentic way. And we can't do that without the Eucharist because it is Christ. It's his priesthood. It's his heaven. And we are participants of it. Okay, as I end here now, I want to uh, leave a little time for questions, refutations, protestations, <laughs> anything like that. Um, you know, I get to I, these seminarians, I mentioned we'd start up with over 150 of them. I could just tell you that their, their faith, who wants to be a seminarian when you see these headlines? So I'm inspired, and uh, Father Jeff Spacker, he's one of our faculty members as well, that these men want to be holy, even with a church that has been riddled with scandal, that that's not going to chase them away. And I know you've got family members and friends. Every, every one of us has family members that have drifted away. They may be angry. What we can do in that sacrifice of the Mass, my sacrifice and yours, is bring them spiritually to it. Bring their pain, their atheism, their struggle, whatever it is, bring that intentionally to that altar. Let's see how Christ can possibly transform. With him, all things are possible. Okay, questions, comments, clarifications? About anything. It doesn't even have to be about my talk, necessarily. Yes? Well, I just want to thank you because years ago I was at a mass and you pointed to me and said, we need people like you to serve. And I became a Eucharistic minister. Mm. And uh, thanks to you. So I just want to thank you very much. Well, thanks for your ministry, for helping. I had a question for you. Yes. I go to the homebound and nursing homes when COVID is over with and mm. before COVID. And when I give someone the Eucharist, before I do, I always say a prayer with them that is like an act of contrition besides giving them the uh, Eucharist because I want them to make an act of contrition beforehand. That's great. And I just want to make sure that that's okay. Sure, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. You know, what we did here before the presentation here, the first holy hour was in the garden after the Last Supper. And actually, Pope John Paul II reflects on that, that the Mass, that whole mystery, so much is going on that the, the promotion of Eucharistic adoration is an extension of the Mass in a way that we can reflect directly with our Lord at adoration, or even if it's not adoration, but before the tabernacle. Now, we know that the apostles the three that were with him grew so weary, overwhelmed with what they just experienced in the upper room and about what they were seeing. I mean, they fell asleep. But the first holy hour, in a sense, was the extension of the mystery that, was, that had just been inaugurated. As I said, it never finished. That was just inaugurated. And so a, an element of our spiritual life that continues to promote Eucharistic amazement is adoration before the Blessed Sacrament. I would encourage you to consider that, to again bring your cares, your concerns, your joys, your sufferings, certainly at Mass, but even there before the Lord. Confront Him. Be with Him. Um, and he'll, he'll bless you in that particular way. Yes, sir. Hi, how's it going? My Good. name is Ben. Ben. Thank you for your talk, Father, today. Um, I was just going to ask you, there's a lot of different words that, um, that I think people use to when they talk about the Eucharist. So people will call it communion, they'll call it Eucharist, they'll even sometimes call it bread and wine. So I, I was going to maybe ask you for maybe an explanation of you know, what's kind of the most appropriate one that you would use or what does each one of them signify? Thank you. Yeah, so the, I mean, the Holy Eucharist is um, the sacrament that we're talking about. Uh, holy communion, that's, that's referring to what's happening. There's a holy communion that's going on. The distribution of holy communion, that's fine to be able to say that. Now, I know in sacristies, um, 
you know, I, I'm a visiting priest because I'm, I'm stationed here, so I have to mind my own manners when I, in sacristies, but I will gently, 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 gently correct when I hear the, the talking amongst themselves, you know, who's giving out the wine? <laughs> Nobody. It's, it's the precious blood. You know, hosts, that's legitimate. The bread, that's legitimate. We understand. But it's the Eucharist who's assisting with the precious chalice, the precious blood, who's distributing the hosts. Uh, so that vocabulary is all fine. Uh, I think if there's an absence of theology, like bread and wine, obviously after the consecration, you could refer to bread or hosts. But I, I think it's better to err on the side of, of the language that's more liturgical, which is the Eucharist. Uh, but I sometimes wonder, and, and thank you, sir, for stepping forward with your ministry. Uh, and I know the churches and pastors are very concerned that while uh, the laity and those in consecrated life uh, are very much uh, not just needed, there's a, a proper role within the liturgy of, of assisting, how well are they catechized? You know, that they understand that they're, when they're reading and they're proclaiming God's word, certainly would, would that done well, but do they understand what's being said there? Those who are distributing Holy Communion, uh, do they understand the theology of what's happening? So I appreciate you raising that, because I think sometimes uh, without that proper catechesis, that even the way we go about the distribution can look very irreverent, because not on purpose, but there can be a lack of understanding of what is actually happening. All the way back to, again, I, you know, I was a pastor just for a year before assignments, but really that the collection time is like halftime. People read the bulletin, run to the bathroom, and I'm like, this is what you're, you're now. This is the most active part, you know. So people don't, you know, I'm not being critical of, of the pastors or catechists, but that is. If people understood, what we, that's why the, for the rest of this year, uh, all of these presentations are is just one way of uh, maybe deepening our catechesis of what's happening. Dr. Jordan. Uh, we have a couple questions from the, ah. the virtual viewers. Um, so the first one from Samuel Anderak. What particular virtues? That's a former seminarian. From Memphis. Hey, Sam. Okay, yes, what <laughs> right, is Sam I'm going to scratch that question. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, what particular virtues might you recommend to those hoping to deepen their love of the Eucharist and to share that with others? Well, I, I would say I would maybe shift the word virtue to what I uh, was saying earlier, uh, and that would be the promotion of Eucharistic adoration. That for us to be able to be, we're all in love with the Lord, right? But people are looking for authenticity today, right? Especially our young people. When Catholics are fired up over the Eucharist because we have so cultivated a discipline, a love, a prayer, a relationship, that witness will be authentic when we share that with others rather than people looking at a bunch of superstitious clowns. Uh, you know, we did a Eucharistic procession when this COVID first broke, this was back in March. And the things that were posted on NOLA.com, because the media caught wind of this in a positive way. The communications director thought this might be good, and we couldn't let people on the property. So there were media out here, and so when they were airing their story in the NOLA.com, oh, the things that, the anti-Catholic things being said about the Eucharistic procession, which was out in the front circle here. I mean, that's, that's where we're at, but the authenticity of sharing our Eucharistic faith begins with our relationship with Christ, and how deep is that? Okay, Jordan. One other question from Adrian Schwing. Can you comment on the significance of the relationship between John 6, so the Bread of Life discourse, and Holy Thursday? Yeah. You know, it's interesting, um, when you read, you know, so John chapter 6, uh, sort of the um, Bread of Life discourse, as it's called, we have and who is he preaching that to? Our Lord, John. It's his disciples. And he's, you cannot, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood for eternal life. So he's giving this, this very specific, clear theological grounding of what's going to happen later at the Last Supper. But he's already beginning to prepare them for what this is all about. And how does John chapter 6 end? Many of his disciples found this teaching too hard already. So the Lord senses this. 
he's reading this, and he says, do you find this teaching too difficult? And maybe I'm not a, the biblical scholars can correct me on this. A little hint of sarcasm. Then Jesus says, well, if you find that teaching hard, what if you were to see the Son of Man rising? Oh, <laughs> we have our first, well, I wouldn't say schism, our first rejection. He said, if you can't begin to understand, which is still rooted in the Jewish theology and history of, of, the, of the eating of the, bland, uh, the, the lamb and uh, the throwing and the sprinkling of the blood and the, the fullness now of what the Lord's bringing to us. If you're going to have a hard time with that, wait till we get to the resurrection. You notice every year at Easter, if it's some of these TV shows, newspapers, it's always the front cover of the magazines, everything to try to refute the resurrection. Or even at Christmas, the same thing. It's all is all made up. So those teachings uh, are just as difficult as the Eucharist. So uh, I think the pedagogy that the Lord is using, beginning with his disciples, they have seen his miracles, they're hearing, they're his disciples, but when it came to the Eucharist, you know, for 1,500 years, this was who we are as a mystical body, but back as we move into the 15th and 16th centuries, were the, the beginning of the Protestant movement. A church without Eucharist, or let's redefine it. You know, we have not recovered from that. Okay, you're getting restless over there. <laughs> I just wanted to ask your opinion, just in your words, to explain um, why you think God has allowed the Euch many Eucharistic miracles to occur. Is it because of our unbelief, or what is your explanation? Well, you know, that's, uh, in, as a matter of fact, let's see here. Father Jeffrey is going to speak on that on October 20th at 6 p.m. We'll see you then. <laughs> so that's the title, uh, Eucharistic Miracles and Saints. So I think this was a, you were planted. She was asked to ask that as a commercial, getting ready for the October event. That was very clever. I'm glad you and Father Jeff worked that out. That was amazing. <laughs> she wants an answer. <laughs> My goodness, uh, just in the, all miracles that we see in the gospel is to reaffirm the faith. It was your faith that saved you. you know, so clearly miracles uh, can be directed to those who don't have faith as a way to reawaken them. But how often the miracle is for the faithful? Not because the faith is, is weak. It's... it's even reassuring and redirecting them with even greater confidence. Uh, so the miracles so often is to reconfirm the faith. Now, uh, others who are spectators who see this, certainly, as I said earlier, the Lord has planted in the heart of every human being the desire for truth. It's there. When faith touches this truth, when the Lord provides that faith and we accept it and in a sense, then we begin to see the miracle. Every Mass is a miracle, <laughs> you know, of what's happening up there. When we go beyond that miraculous event to some of the other Eucharistic miracles to confirm the faith of Christians and hopefully to reawaken faith in non-Christians or non-Catholics. Okay, to respect your time, we, we were very much announcing that uh, we would have adoration at 5.30, this presentation at 6. We would conclude at 7, which it is. So I'm going to uh, conclude with the prayer that John Paul II concluded with in the encyclical on the Eucharist. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And he takes this prayer from the words of St. Thomas Aquinas. Come then, good shepherd, bread divine. Still show to us thy mercy sign. O oh, feed us, still keep us thine so we may see thy glory shine in fields of immortality. O thou the wisest, mightiest, best, our present food, our future rest, come, make each of us thy chosen guest, co-heirs of thine and comrades blessed with saints whose dwelling is with thee. Dearest Heavenly Father, as our church now continues to celebrate the most essential element of our Catholic faith, the Eucharist. We pray for your graces during this year of the Eucharist and St. Joseph. And our families, our parishes, this archdiocesan church, Lord, 
we're very particularly concerned about those who've left the faith, who no longer practice the faith, that by your grace, by our prayers, they may come back to you and enjoy and know your love and your mercy as we bring this prayer before you through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you all, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go in peace. Have a good evening. Thank you all. Father Jim, he, he always says that at the end of, of anything. He goes, well, that's it. Um, so his, his classic phrase. Uh, thank you so much, Father Jim. Uh, thank you all for being here tonight. We hope you enjoyed the first of, of this, this year-long presentation. Um, we'll be sending a follow-up email tomorrow with the link to the recording. So if you want to watch it again, if you want to share it with family and friends, we certainly encourage you to do that. You can register for our next event in the same way that you registered for this one. And I would encourage you to, you know, to bring a friend next time so that we can fill the whole auditorium. And, um, and when we fill it, then we can have watch parties at our parishes and we can get some groups together, um, you know, building a community around our shared love for the Eucharist. This is a whole, a whole year's worth of, um, of growth in our knowledge, understanding, and in our love. So thank you all for being here tonight, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks.